And welcome to the artist task here in the Jewish Museum. My special welcome goes to Mrs. Kominski Krum. Okay, Laura Fontaine. Richard Shelton. And last but not least, Robert Crumb. My name is Anton Liebel. I am the Chief Administrator in the Department of Arts and Culture in the city of Munich. And I was asked to give a short um, introduction, and I will focus on three aspects. But have no fear, I will keep it short and simple. First of all, I want to say a few words about Robert Crumb. For all of us, it's an extraordinary <laughs> event that the father of the underground comic and his equally successful wife. No way! <laughs> were brave enough to leave the little village in France and come to the big city in Munich. Thank you very much. <laughs> the organizers of this comic festival, Mr. Lindstedt and Mr. Komper, have landed a... have landed a remarkable crew to invite Mr. Robert Crumb here. It is said that it is the first time you are in a comic festival here in Germany. Thank you very much. There's, there's also an exhibition honoring him. It is called A Tribute to Robert Crumb. 80 artists honor the master of comic in the America House. It starts tomorrow. And I've read that Robert Crumb has already arrived at the Olympus with the exhibition in the Museum of Modern Arts in Paris last year. And I can only wonder how you will classify your participation here. <laughs> Perhaps we will appear in a future copy. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> then I change the subject and I come to the, com uh, to the Comet Festival. We are expecting about 11,000 visitors and it's an important cooperative project for the Department of Arts and Culture. And the concept is as simple as a successful. That means we have about 43 different events, including exhibitions, workshops, discussions, and also possibilities for discovery and meeting others. This year the guest band is Italy, and there will be a Peng Prize Awards, and there will be several anniversaries. 75 years Superman, 75 years of Spiro, 50 years of Vicky, and 40 years of Hagar. And I'm feeling as old as Mr. Natural just saying this. <laughs> and, ah, okay, <laughs> lasts a bit. Okay, third subject, thanks. Without sponsors, volunteers and supporters, this comic festival is impossible. And therefore, thanks to all of them. And special thanks go to the responsible organizers, Herr Michael Kompa and Heine Lundstedt. And last but not least, thank you for your interest. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Bibel. Um, we are also want to thank the city of Munich who helped us with the festival, not only this year, but all the other years in the past. And we are very proud that a comic culture is a part of German culture and a part of Munich culture. And therefore, we want to thank the city of Munich. And I think he had to get a bit. Yeah, 
you have to talk English, so I also have to talk English. Yeah, I will see that it will not take so too long. Yeah, he already, Mr. Bibel already said what uh, kind of exhibitions we have. Tomorrow it will really start, but we already shown in the, in the last days already uh, 15 exhibitions started all over the city, like the Complete Festival. We have uh, famous locations like the Alte Rathaus and the Künstlerhaus am Limbachplatz. We like to invite you to join us at the festival. Please uh, take our information material at the desk there. And I hope you will enjoy the talk and I hope you will enjoy the festival. I especially want to thank my friend Michael Komper, with whom it's a great, great pleasure again to organize the festival. And without him, uh, who is the guy who goes to the people and asks them if they want to come to the festival without being afraid, without him, we won't have this special guest of honor here in Munich. And thank you, Michael. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little bit flattered. I didn't, I didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> I was not prepared. Okay. But at all, I think it's, it's great that we have uh, these unique couple, Robert from Aline Kram kominski uh, together with Gilbert Schelt and Laura Fontaine here. And for that, I think it's not only our work that I am here. I think it's more we have to thank and thank in the memory of a great artist, Spain Rodriguez. <laughs> Spain Rodriguez, also a great underground artist. He died last year in cancer, on cancer, and he was the guy who introduced Robert and Aline. He introduced last year, November, November, not December, last year, November, and he introduced also Robert and Gilbert. So I think without Spain Rodriguez, this evening wouldn't be possible, and anyway, this great couple, this unique couple. Is, is Spain worth known in Germany or not? Yes. 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 Only for the experts, Ma mainly for the experts. Oh, that's an expert. That's an expert. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, Spain, wherever you are. Have a good look tonight. I've seen a lot of people here with photos and with books and we are really happy that you're so interested and that, that you love the arts work of uh, Robert Crumb. Even records, even records, t-shirts. <laughs> but, but I'm sorry there won't be an official signing session during the festival and really if you love and respect the artwork of Robert Crump, and if you want to respect Robert Crump as a person, please don't ask for signings. There is no official signing session, but Robert did to, uh, a signing in the hotel. He prepared something about maybe 300? I signed it a lot. A lot. <laughs> 300, 300 or 400 prints, and from tomorrow on, for everybody who comes to the festival, the first, we, we will split it in four parts, that every day there's a chance when you buy the Robert Crump tribute album, you will get the print for free. Yeah, we will, we will do tomorrow a signing session. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we will do tomorrow a signing session at the beginning of the comic festival with Aline. And there's a, uh, the chance to get a signing by Aline, but really no chance for a signing for Robert Crump. I'm sorry for that. Please respect that. The next thing I want to ask you for your respect, please no flash photography. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and please no photos from front of here. When you want to do a photo, stay, please, a little bit. Stay back. Yeah. But really, we are happy to have two 
events with Robert uh, as a talking panel, and I think both evenings will be different. Tonight we talk with Robert Alin, Laura Fontaine, who the wife of Gilbert Shelton, was on the party where they both met, where they had been introduced by Spain Rodriguez. I think Spain had invited you too? No, it was no. our house. Ah, it was no, at no, our house. No, oh. no, 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 a long time, they are connected, and it still works. So I think... <laughs> so anyway, I guess we will hear tonight something on a great marriage, on a great couple, and tomorrow we will hear something on underground comics with the two legendary pioneers of underground with Robert and Gilbert in the America House, and also the German pioneer of underground comics, Gerhard Seyfried, who is also here. So enjoy the, this evening and enjoy Comic Festival in Munich. Thank you. We talked very, very briefly, or, or Michael talked very briefly, about the fact that Spain played a role in getting both you and Gilbert together and you and Aileen together. Perhaps Aileen could tell us why Spain thought she should meet Robert. Yeah, it's interesting. When, when Spain met me, you know, my name was Kaminsky, and Robert had just drawn a character named Honey Bunch Kaminsky. And plus, uh, he had also done a character named Dale Steinberger, the Jewish cowgirl. And I was a cowgirl living in, in Arizona, actually living out that fantasy. And Spain came here to visit a mutual friend. And when he met me, he said, it's weird. It's like he drew you, but you exist. And you sure you never met this guy? I said, no, I never met him. So he said, I have to introduce you to him. And that's how that happened. So. You can say that maybe he conjured up this person and they arrived and then maybe he regretted it or maybe not. But anyway, it's definitely a weird kind of destiny. And I wasn't necessarily interested in getting married, neither was he, but you know, <laughs> yeah. he, he was married and so was I actually. Right. <laughs> Already married to other people, but right. nevertheless, this destiny was a powerful force that compelled us to be together. And 42 years later, we're still together. And now we're grandparents. <laughs> you, were, you were already living in San Francisco, Robert. Well, I was, at the time, I was hanging around San Francisco. I wasn't really living there. I was, I was hanging around there a lot. But you but, started publishing your own South Comics. Yeah, I already had a little bit of reputation going for the underground comics when I met Aileen in 71. I think it had been going on for about three years already. I didn't like your comics that much. I like actually Justin Green's comics better. Right. Yeah. And he actually influenced me more. He's a very autobiographical. You probably don't know him. He's not well known. But he did autobiographical comics. The that's experts the will know. Yeah, he's the first person really that I know of to do autobiographical comics. And he was half Jewish and half Catholic, and he had the total neurosis of both. <laughs> His work was unbelievable. When I saw that, it gave me an idea of how I could work, what I should do. It really put a light bulb off over Is, my head. Anybody here know Justin Green's work? Three One. people. Uh, he has a wonderful, yeah. wonderful title of his first book, which was Binky Brown Meets the Holy Virgin Mary. Yeah. 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 So anyway, I, when I went to San Francisco, I actually went to meet Justin Green to make a pilgrimage to meet him, who totally influenced me. But then there was a detour when I met Robert. So. <laughs> right. When I first met Aileen, 
she was she was wearing like hot pants and boots. She looked her own, very sexy and yeah, I never turned on it. And there was always lots of men hovering around her all the time. It was actually it took a long time to, to actually uh, get her attention. So I used to go to her house and always be five men hanging around there. <laughs> they were sitting around like waiting to see who was going to be the last one left to get to stay there overnight. <laughs> you and the end. You got last and everybody. You outweighed everybody else, obviously. <laughs> I was very flattered that you liked me. Did, I was only 23, can you imagine that? She, she was very wild. Didn't, didn't uh, you have a little incident with your now ex-husband uh, oh, no, coming to... Your, well, it was your boyfriend, that's right. Ray. You know, when Robert... When I came from Arizona, I, I left Arizona because I had a, I was really being a cowgirl, and I had a real cowboy boyfriend when I was being a Jewish cowgirl. But it was so violent there, I had to get out of there because I saw these people really did live with guns on their in their daily lives, and I saw if I hang around here, I'll be killed. I have to get out. This is fun, but so I moved to San Francisco, and I was involved with Robert, and I left one day to go to work, and Robert was there, and this ex-boyfriend of mine, the Ray. cowboy Ray was visiting with my brother, and they had come up to bring me back to Arizona. Yeah, Ray was still in love with you. you. You wanted to take you back to Arizona. So I went to work, and Robert was left at the house with Ray, and... <laughs> Robert, now take a little story. Ray pulled out a big six-shooter and put it to my head like this, and, and pulled the hammer back, and it was like laughing maniacally, going... <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, okay, if you're going to do it, get it over with. And they put it away. He said, nah, just kidding. <laughs> so, but then he went back to Arizona, and was it, a couple months later, he got shot in the back and killed by some guy he was feuding with about it, some woman or something. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Eileen, yeah. when you came to San Francisco, you weren't a cartoonist. Yeah. Well, I came to San Francisco because I wanted to get comics published. I was a painter, I was in art school, and I just got my degree in painting. But painting at that time was ac abstract expressionism, which had nothing to do with me. And I was always like telling stories and writing funny, doing funny drawings, which was completely not popular, not the thing to do at that time. So when I saw underground comics, I wanted to go someplace where people were working on comics, and that was San Francisco. Well, the fine art world at that time had utter contempt for yeah. comics. It was comics, why would you want... Art and nothing else. Well, at least it should be, you know, painting on canvases with oil paints, not, not drawing comics. It's not to put any detail in my work, to use a big house painting brush, and I, 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 Totally foreign to me. Come on, Jackson Pollock and like that. So, but when I got to San Francisco, there actually was a group of women artists putting together the first women's comics. So you gotta talk, was, say, say something about how that was kind of like this era in which there was this blossoming of these underground comics. So those, the, all these little publishers, they wanted to publish any comics they could get. So there was a lot of people, some who of whom were total rank amateurs drawing comics like and getting me. getting them published. So it was a yeah. good good time to be there. It was because of Robert's comments and the success of this first wave of Zap comics the that there was. Yeah, the Gilberts and the first Zap comics were very successful, so a lot of small publishers started getting in on the act and wanting to publish anything there were desperately looking for work. So this was the first women's comics. They didn't have enough work to fill up the comic because there were no women cartoonists. There was no history of women cartoonists, really, and there were no women doing comics. So anyone that like was even vaguely interested, they asked to do something. I, I got involved in it, and then I met a woman on a bus who I saw drawing in a sketchbook, and I said, you want to draw comics? She said, yeah, why not? And I brought her to <laughs> read it, and she got in the comic. That was Diane Newman who went on to have a career drawing comics, but that, that's how it was during that period of time. And it was, what about Pat Moody, and what happened to her? I don't know, but anyway, there were a lot of, lots of different people passed through that scene. Some stayed with it, most didn't, most went on to do other things. You look at that stuff now, a lot of it's totally unreadable. It was mostly bad, mostly unprofessional, bad drawing. People couldn't tell stories. It was really, really bad. Also, they were all high. They couldn't even hear it. They were so stoned, they couldn't Not tell all. Hear it. Well, I went through... About a year ago, I went through all these early underground comics that I have that I saved, 
and 85% of it was unreadable. <laughs> For myself, I couldn't draw at all, like in comic drawings, I was like a, much more of a fine artiste. But you, know? you were funny and you were a good I could, I could tell story. I could tell stories because my grandfather took me to see Jewish stand-up comedians <laughs> all through the 1950s in New York, and I saw the best. I saw Jackie Mason, Alan King, Joey Bishop, Henny Youngman, all of them. These names don't mean anything. No, but I saw, I saw the great, great stand-up Jewish comedians. I was raised on Youngman. Yeah, I was raised on like corny Jewish humor, you know? Jackie Mason. And I had to tell these stories. So for me, the storytelling was natural. I just couldn't make the characters ever look the same in two panels. And I couldn't, I changed their outfit every, when I felt like I changed the clothes, the hair. Always, it was completely inconsistent in terms of drawing. But I was a reasonably good storyteller. And then you and, and Diane actually did a spin-off and yeah. did Twisted Sisters together. Well, Diane Newman and I spun off from the original women's comic book because they were very This is militant. the one she met on the bus. Yeah, the one on the bus. But anyway, she, the original group were very militant feminists and they really were anti-men. And Diane and I were involved with male cartoonists, which made us like Uncle Tom. Male were, chauvinist yeah, cartoonists. They told me that I was going out with the worst male chauvinist pig on the planet, therefore I had to make a choice between him and them. So I left them. And Diane also was going out with Bill Griffith, who wasn't as much of a male chauvinist pig, but nevertheless, he was a male cartoonist. So we left. We were like the bad girl cartoonists because we wanted to be tough, but we liked men, and that was bad. <laughs> we also liked dre we dressed in sexy clothes, and that was bad. Uh, and uh, so we did. We started a comic called Twisted Sisters, which was like the bad girl comic, and we were totally ostracized for that. But you know, in the end, we made our stand, and we were kind of happy with that position. And so, how did you and Robert start working together? Because you've been drawing stories together for. A Almost 40 years, over 35 years. 40 years. Me tell the story of how we started drawing comics together. Uh, gosh, it, was, it was a long time ago. Jesus. When you were a kid, you drew with your brother. Yeah, my brother used to make me draw comics with him, where he would draw his character and I would draw mine, and we'd just improvise, have them interact with each other, and, and try and make it some cohesive story. So. I had this experience, so <clears throat> when Aileen went and we were living together in Potter Valley, she had her little trailer. Northern California. Northern California. In Northern California. And I had a little cabin, so we had separate residences, but we were hanging out together. It was a, a, hippie, a failed hippie commune. That's right. It was a hippie commune. And I was, we were still having other, you know, relationships, involvements, and so I was involved with this other girl named Frankie. And Frankie came up to Potter Valley to, to see me, and and she got out of the car with her suitcase and said, oh, I'm going to like living here. And Aileen kind of flipped out about that and was very angry. And So I, I'm in my little cabin with Frankie, and Aileen's like walking up and down in front of the cabin and all pissed off. And, and, then, and then she tripped and fell and broke her foot. So then we... I said, Frankie, this is not going to work out. So we took her back, put her back on the bus, and then, so then Aileen, we took her to the hospital, and she had her foot in a cast, and so she was laid up, she was kind of crippled, and it was wind raining. Right. So I suggested that we, just to pass the time while she was crippled, try and do some comics together at collaborations like I had done with my brother. Because she and, was driving you nuts, right? Well, I felt bad, you know, I felt kind of guilty. And it worked out really well, so we really enjoyed this comic. Well, we didn't do it to publish, we just did it to amuse ourselves. At no first, yeah. At first it was just, yeah, to entertain ourselves over the winter. Dennis, didn't you visit during that time? Yeah, Dennis Kitchen, the publisher, came to visit us that time when we were working on that first one. Really? Yeah, I think so, I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jeez. But you didn't publish it, Justin. No, Keith Green published it. <laughs> he did? Keith Green, that crook? Yeah, Keith Jesus. Green. Justin Green's brother, the cartoonist that we told you about, he had kind of a crook brother. <coughs> and he wanted to he came up there and saw that comic and wanted to publish it. So we just said, oh, well, why not? He was, he was taking all the money and spending it on cocaine. But he did tell us that first Dirty Laundry. Yeah, we called it Dirty Laundry. Dirty Laundry, right? Let's say something or other, anyway. 
Um, but yeah, you know, Terry Zweigoff, the filmmaker, gave us the name for the comic because we showed him the work and we asked him what he thought of it. He said, this is the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. It's like hanging out your dirty laundry in public. I said, oh, what a good, that's a good name. <laughs> that's how we named it Dirty Laundry. And that was the name of the first books we did yeah. together. When was the first Dirty Laundry published? 74. A lot of people were uh, crumb fans as young guys of like my work. They didn't like seeing Aileen's work in the same book with mine. They, they so, thought since her drawing style was kind of crude, they, didn't, they were highly offended that she was in the same book with me. Right? So, they were all these nasty, mean letters saying, she might be great in, in the sack, but keep her off the fucking page. <laughs> Let her do the cooking, you do the cartooning. Right. That's right. Didn't, didn't someone call you a, a, what was it, the hanger, not a hanger, camp, camp follower. Camp follower, that was Trina that called yeah. it, camp follower. No, but afterward about your using Robert. Oh, a talentless parasite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I eventually, I'm, one day I'm going to do a book with that title, I think it's a great title. Oh, talentless yeah. parasite. <laughs> <laughs> but then in the 1980s, after you had left Potter Valley and moved into the Central Valley of right. Virginia, yeah. you started a magazine. Started together. Weirdo, yeah. And that actually led to not only your doing work together, but also uh, introducing quite a few other artists, young artists, who were unknown at the time, who had become quite successful. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us about that? That was started in 1981, and it lasted until 1991. Yep, that's right. And the timing was really not terribly opportune for you, Annie, was it? Uh, no, 1981? It was just when it gave birth to our daughter Sophie that Robert decided to do this new magazine. I remember him having her on his knees, bouncing her on, he's like trying to draw the comments and stuff. Well, what, what kind of happened was that there was this fad in the early 70s for underground comics, and there was all these head shops and, and psychedelic shops that were selling these comics. And then it kind of died down in the late 70s, the whole thing kind of died down. And some people even said, yeah, this is underground comics are dead, it's a dead thing. But we kept doing them, some people kept doing them anyway. But it was a very small scale, the sales were very small to the whole thing. And even in the 80s when we were doing Weirdo, there was, the pay was very little. The, the, the sales figures, the amount of copies that were sold was very small. It was a small time thing. Robert, you edited the first uh, issues of Weirdo. How many? I edited the first eight issues, then Peter Bag edited eight issues, and then Aileen took it over and she edited the last uh, eight or nine issues. I forget what it was. Well, ironically, even though comics weren't selling and the whole industry was really going under well, industry is but, a small, it was, but there were tons of young artists who'd been influenced by the first underground com cartoonists <coughs> were doing really interesting work. So that's part of our motivation for doing the magazine was there were all these great yeah. unpublished artists around and there was there were no venues for them really to publish them. At the same time that we started Weirdo, Art Spiegelman and Francoise <coughs> Malie started Raw magazine also. And that was interesting because that was more arty and New more York. higher level production values. It was very artistic. And we were like the lowbrow brand X, and it was kind of good. There were two separate things going on simultaneously. And between both of them, a lot of artists who are now very famous and do all these graphic novels started at that time. So it was important that that happened. And Art Spiegelman said Weirdo was a piece of shit. <laughs> but and you said Raw was pretentious. <laughs> well, yeah. But who were somebody? Some of these artists that, uh, were published in both uh, Widow or in uh, Raw. Do you remember? Uh, Charles Burns? Julie Dusay, Charles Burns. Uh, did we use Charles Burns in Weirdo? Yeah, I think Roy, so. Uh, Joe Matt, um, Peter Bass, Warden, Peter Bass, Dory uh, Cedar, yeah. uh, Eleanor Norfless, Phoebe Glitter, Dory Cedar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who else? Uh, Peter Bag. Yeah. You said him right. Did we just have to Seth? No, we didn't use him. Um, Nobody remembers Eleanor Norfless. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I 
She should have changed her name. She was totally psycho. Carol Tyler. Plus the old line yeah, in Spain, Justin, and and Justin Green, and yeah. Kim Deitch, and people like that, or the earlier guys, be some of them. And we let people do anything. We just like told yeah. them to do the weirdest stuff possible, you know. And Not any boat, you yeah. When you were editing, uh, tell them about, you actually got, the, the artist got paid. Yeah. But it wasn't easy. No, we, last guest was our publisher, that was Ron Turner, dear friend, but you know, you had to go down there and to get the checks for the artists, otherwise they would never get paid. And you had to sit there for a few hours and he would write one or two checks and then he would get hungry, you'd have to go eat a burrito with him at the Mexican restaurant. And he'd come back and the phone would ring and the checkbook would get buried under a bunch of junk and then a few hours later he'd write another few checks. He'd be there all day to get a check for each artist, even though the pay was crappy. And then you had to mail the checks to each artist, otherwise they would never have gotten paid. But the artist didn't appreciate it, neither did the publisher. It was like an unpaid, unappreciated job. That's why nobody could do it for too long. It was a no-win situation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but now, it was a nice magazine. Yes. Yeah. Now there's going to be a, a collection of your stories from there. But to, to go back to the two of you working together, there's a book called Draw Together that, that collects all right. of your stories. Got all our stories, our complete works of okay. our collaborations. Up until the book. Yeah, we did some new ones for this book too. We did some in, I guess, 2012. Or That's 2012. not published in Germany, right? Yeah. I, someone, I thought I, I saw someone that was a copy of it. Someone German. have a copy of our know. book in See, German? It's the only English one. Oh, English. 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 Oh, okay, it's in English. English. Not in German. Yeah. Does everybody here understand English? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't, tell us. <laughs> I see some guys this. book came out in French before it came out in English, and the French did a really nice job, and they seemed to really appreciate it, which was kind of touching and surprising. I, I wasn't sure. Who? The French, French. French liked it. Yeah, that was kind of surprising. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah, we didn't know. But it came out in France before it came out in America, actually. So but that was actually, really cool. You live in France. How yeah, did you end up there? How did we end up in France? Well, in the 1980s, I stopped drinking and I got sober. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to drastically change my life and move to another continent. What are you doing? You give up drinking, you have to fill your time with Aileen something. had her ups and downs with yeah. alcohol. Yeah. So Recently, I, I was talking to her about, she said, how how wild she was when she was young. She said, yeah, I had sex with hundreds of men, but I don't remember any of them because I was drunk the whole time. Thank, thank God. Thank God. Thank God I'd be scarred from the memories otherwise. I don't remember their Save names, me. I don't remember their faces. Saved me that I, I can't remember any of them, thank God. I wouldn't be able to go on. Oh, jeez. But, um, you no, know, that was my midlife crisis, sober period there in the, when I ended my right. early 40s. She, I had to do something. She went into radical. psychotherapy yeah. in 1988 or 87, was it? I don't know. So I had, and I also wanted to get our daughter. I wanted something to shake up our daughter's life because she was about to become like a spoiled American teenager. I thought, what am, what am I going to do? i got to get her out of here. Before so, they started predating, and she was only nine. Yeah, everything. She spent a long time looking for the right psychotherapist for her. Yeah, and she, yeah. <laughs> she kept going to these people and interviewing these psychotherapists, and and they were, they were none of them were Jewish, so they didn't get her. They said she would try and make these Jewish jokes about her. Neurosis, and they, they just, that's very sad. Said, yeah, really sorry. You're a really sad person, we feel really sorry for. I said, no, that was funny. <laughs> so then, wasn't funny at all. finally, she met this Jewish psychiatrist, his name was Sheldon Berkowitz, and she told her jokes about herself. Out of his chair. Was out. You're hired. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> he got the jokes, so he was hired. A year later, and Ten thousand dollars later, she was cured. Ever knows? <laughs> yeah, we left the country. Right, and she wanted to get out of America. I, and I said, I woke up one morning. I'm living in France. I asked her, How did we end up living in France? And she told me, Well, for the last twenty years, you just bitched and complained so much about America. I said, Let's, We got to get the hell out of there. So she, she engineered the whole. Thing, moving to France. The only thing he told him was because he has a fabulous 78 record collection. Yes. He said, 
if one record breaks, I'm divorcing you. <laughs> and they all arrived right. in perfect condition. No oh, breakage. Wow. Not a single one. Probably for you. I'm a good packer. <laughs> she has motivation. Yeah. Well, why did you choose France? Boy, you were there. <laughs> you know, Laura is Robert's agent, and she and Gilbert were like the groundbreakers. They were already living there. Yeah, why did you choose France? Because I house in France. I house in France. I built their cats in the summer, but there was my daughter, watered the plants, and my daughter and I spent the summer in Paris, and we really loved it. And I, then, I think she chose France because of. The French women are all really skinny, so she knew there'd be no competition. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's what I was suspecting. No, my father also was in Paris right after the war. He was a photographer for the Stars and Stripes, the American military newspaper, and he fell in love with Paris. And his mother made him come back out of guilt, and I think like that was the only moment he was happy in his life. So I think he like sort of uh, impregnated me with the idea that yeah. Paris was a wonderful place. So you told me that when you were a kid, he was always talking about how great yeah. Paris was and everything. So I had some kind of, you know, I was kind of had a prejudice towards Paris at that time yeah. also. But I also had a lot of friends living in the area. We don't live in Paris, we live in the south of France. I had a lot of friends living there doing weird adventures. So I went to visit all my crazy girlfriends that already lived there. And I thought, this is a place I could probably live in. I was visiting the village we live in now, and I woke up in the morning and I thought, yep, this is the place for me. Don't ask me why, but I felt totally comfortable there. And 23 years later, I still right. feel really good there. Right. And now our daughter's married to a French guy, and we have right. two little half-breed so. French-American <laughs> grandchildren. So we're not going anywhere now. No, we're it. tied to France by blood that's now. Right. <laughs> blood and good food. Right. It's a nice country to live in, i got to say. You know. As long as you don't have to work there, it's fine. Yeah, if you don't have to do business with the French, it's a great place. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you have agents for. Yeah, thank God for Laura. She, she makes sure that they pay every penny, every cent. And the Italians, she gets the Italians to pay. That's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Italians don't <have> never pay. <laughs> Get the, uh, the Russians to pay. <laughs> Unbelievable. But the, the French are, you know, if they don't, they never pay. They never pay. But if you could walk into their office, oh, Monsieur Crom, uh, yeah, I was just going to write you a check. <laughs> Do you think that if you'd still been living in the States, you would have done the book of Genesis? Would I have done Genesis? I have no idea what I'd be doing if I lived in the States. I have no idea. Could you have done the book of Genesis without Aileen? Well, no. Aileen, uh, i got to be grateful to her because she saw that I was not going to get this done if I stayed at home to do it because there's constant interruptions and comings and goings. And, records and right, the records I got to fuss with them. my records, right? So she found this place way up in the hills, this little cabin for rent, and I worked on it there in total isolation, which was really great. Loved it. And then I got it done. All thanks to Aileen. Right. <laughs> I've heard that the Germans didn't, didn't like Genesis so much, my book of Genesis, because they thought it was like too, wasn't, I wasn't making fun of Genesis, I wasn't satirizing it or ridiculing it, and that was a big disappointment to the German Crumb fans. I heard that. But why didn't you satirize it? Why didn't I satirize it? But it really doesn't need satirizing. It's so it's bizarre and strange on its own that I, I decided just to do a straight illustration job of it and, and let it stand on its own, you know, strangeness. Are you still, after all these years, are you still drawing together? Yeah, we do. That's, most of the comics that I've done in the last 10 years have been collaborations with Aileen, besides Genesis, mostly. So there you go. Maybe if... We, we started drawing a, a strip for this French woman's magazine called Cosette a couple of years ago. Cosette means sort of a chatty, yeah. chatting back and forth. And 
We yeah. did one for each issue, kind of monthly, and after a year, they dumped us. They, dumped, they, they didn't get us. I don't know, it didn't work somehow. <laughs> no, we tried very hard to translate into French and, and everything. I don't know. They didn't get it. Well, it, Cosette is a sort of a Paris based, right. Paris oriented, 30 something, and they're writing about being grandparents and uh, living in rural France. And the readers That's it. We didn't were too get old it. for them. We were too old. <laughs> Maybe um, people here have some questions they'd like you to ask. Yeah? Okay. Is it time to open the floor? Maybe you want to talk about the three of you drawing together. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Daughter, right? yeah. We've done a, a couple of strips where we included our daughter. Sophie is a very good cartoonist artist also. I, we went to this Crum family reunion in the United States in 2008 and we took Sophie with us. And we did a four-page comic about that for the New Yorker. And Sophie, so her part of that, she really pulled that together for us, that strip. She really did a, a good job with that. And Sophie's still writing or drawing anyway, even though she has two small children. Yeah, she draws a lot about her life being a mother with two small kids, just for her sketchbook. But it's really hysterically funny stuff. It's really amazing. It's kind of up our daughter there. Yeah, no, it's really good. So, I don't know if she'll ever publish it or not, but it's pretty good stuff anyway. So, yeah, she's an interesting artist. She's not like Robert or me. She's definitely another third thing, really different. It's interesting to see. So. She does tattoos too. But think yeah. of it, we're probably yeah. the only family in the world that ever drew comics together. Three. Absolutely. Mother, father, daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and you drew each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right, we do. Well, could you just briefly talk about when you do stories together, how, you how it works? That's interesting. Well, we used to, when we first started drawing comics together, it was very spontaneous. We'd just start in in the upper left hand corner. I would, or she would start, or I would start it, and we just, one of us would address the other one, and then without knowing what the other one was going to say, and then the other one would come back, and we just pass it back and forth with no we plan at pencil. all. We first do a couple of pages in pencil, right. and then we each ink a page, and then switch, and then each would ink them. We right. still do that, more or less. We yeah. work in pencil. You do your own personality. Yeah, we draw personal. ourselves in our own, uh, our own worlds. Yes. But when we worked for the New Yorker for a period of time, we had restrictions of a number of pages, and sometimes we'd have to cover a specific story. So we got a little bit more tighter into the writing of the material right. during that time. Right. It's a little bit more coherent. Like the New Yorker sent us to the Cannes Film Festival. So and we, Fashion Week. We did and, a strip about yeah. that. We did a strip about my tape dispenser. And you couldn't use curse words and you couldn't show certain things and you had to like, have a certain number of pages yeah. and everything. Because so the New Yorker is a big mainstream magazine in America. So. so I think that made our work get tighter in a certain way, a little bit more, more coherent in terms of storytelling. Before that, it rambled on and on. I don't know which is better, but... It made you more disciplined. More disciplined in our storytelling. And then right. in Cause That, we had to do one page things. So if you have one page, you have to get to the point pretty quickly. So that kind of changed it, affected it a little bit, made it more, more coherent. So before that, really, sometimes the stories have no point. Robert, didn't you say once that you kind of throw out an idea and Aileen runs with it? Well, yeah, I, it's in, in American in comedy teams in the United States, it's always like the straight man and then the, the funny guy or the funny person. The straight man just throws out a lead line, and the the, the funny one then like makes something out of that, that that's laugh that's funny. That's kind of I'm kind of the the straight guy in the. <laughs> And the thing with Aileen, and she just has this kind of Jewish compulsive thing that just pours out of her, this, this comedy routine that just goes on and on. Like in our real life, she's often just makes me fall on the floor laughing. She just has this Jewish comedy thing. It's just, it's, I don't know where it comes from. And you know where it comes from? Where does it come from, Oh, yeah. Jackie Mason, Joey Bishop, <laughs> Gracie Allen, George Gracie Burns, Allen, yeah. totally. Jack Benny. Right. Yeah. It's, a, it's a major part of American Sid humor. Caesar, is Nat Jewish. Nat Hiken, you know. Marx Brothers, yeah. this one. Phil Silver's all Silver's. Yeah, all of them. Phil Silver's. Forget him. Yeah. <laughs> Sergeant Bilko. Phyllis Diller, Joan Rivers, one of my idols, you know. Joan Rivers, right. 
What's the general what the, the green salting guy? Uh, Any, uh, no, Don Rickles. Don Rickles. Yeah, right. Don't forget him. Yeah. Oh. David calls, sometimes yeah. calls herself yeah. Don or Rickles. Yeah. There's an LP here, Unexpurgated Folk Song of Men. And Chris Rackwitz told me that you did the cover for this LP. Yes. And uh, Mac McCormick was not amused when he saw it, and so he didn't issue the LP. Is this story right? Uh, well, the way I remember it a long time ago, that's very obscure information. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he just somehow never published the record. It was never published. It was not published, no. Yeah, so no, I don't no. know what happened to that cover. I never saw it again. But you did the cover. I did, yeah, but it was never never used. And I don't know what happened to it. It was 70 other materials and that stuff. That's very obscure stuff. <laughs> that guy's an expert. <laughs> Yes, I remember this. This is uh, for the Spine Towns and Islands catalog. I, this was like 1978, I believe. Yeah. When we first came here. When I first went to Hamburg, yeah, the first time we came to Germany. With all of the music. Right. So, um, <laughs> they, of course, the Germans, they. And they wrote once and they wanted to impress us with German rock and roll, which was just terrible. <laughs> so I said, I said, I please take me to a beer hall where they play like those, have a big brass band with, with playing like polkas and waltzes. And Harry, Harry says, I hate that music. Oh. But I persuaded and they took us to this big dance hall in, in uh, Hamburg. That time probably doesn't exist anymore. And they had this brass band lined up on the stage with a big bass horn on each end. They were great. It was great. So I was very happy. And, and Harry was completely miserable. <laughs> After about an hour, he said, can we leave now? We had enough of this. <laughs> yeah, that's the story on that. Country with a very vibrant comic scene, France. Yes, France that's has right. a very vibrant comic scene. The United States as well, yes. a lot of other countries. To what extent are you following what younger cartoonists are doing nowadays, and which ones do you like in particular, or which modern trends do you less like currently? Well, you know, it's, this is the age of the graphic novel. It's very, it's very different because a lot of people now are taking comics very seriously. So it's not like when I was a kid. You have a slightly warped. Why, you, why, what do you think? Novel. Because graphic novels, basically comics are graphic novels, just the physical presentation. Yes, but we used to call them comics and now they call them graphic novels. And, you know, a novel implies something long. And it, a lot has to do with just the industrial realities. Nobody, they, they say now, you can't sell one of these cheap little comic pamphlets. They call them pamphlets now, those little thin comic books. But you, you can't sell, there's no profit margin, there's no, you can't make any money, so it has to be a big thick book, it has to be a hundred pages or something. It's Art Spiegelman's fault, it started with Mouse, you know, that was such a big Spiegelman, hit, right. but then they wanted, you know, more that's right. that kind of thing, yeah. so that started a whole way of... A new industry. People right. taking themselves very seriously and really having a lot to say about themselves and their lives and adventures, but there's some great stuff like yes. Joe Sacco, who does Among great, all that, he's good great stuff. amazing journalistic yes. stuff, and Persepolis, that... Uh, Martin Satrapi, who did that yeah. story about her growing up in Iran, and there's a lot of amazing stuff. And Carol Tyler, Phoebe Glickner, um, there's a lot yeah. of great stuff. Alison Bechtel. Yeah. Alison Bechtel. Yeah. Dan Klaus did some, yeah. did some great stuff recently, it's still good uh, stuff. Chester Brown, yeah. uh, Seth, Joe Matt, oh, there's a lot of really good stuff. You see so. Chester Brown's new book about going around hanging out <coughs> prostitutes. It's yeah. great. Yeah. Paying yeah. for it. Paying for it. It's great. It's great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so there's really a lot, to me, I'm really happy to see a lot of great stuff coming out. Yeah, but there's a lot of, there's also a lot of stuff that's kind of pretentious, but it was ever thus, you know, that's the way, that's the way it goes. But. Production values are higher. Excuse me, do you speak French? Do you read any French comics? Me? Which one I do? She's, she's very fluent in French, but I'm not. I, I just let her do the talking. I'm <laughs> dealing with French people. But <clears throat> there's one French cartoonist that I like very much, so I really try to read the 
the text in it is a cartoonist named David Surdrill. But he's not very widely known or appreciated, even in France. His work is great to me, it's great. It's very, very well drawn and has a dark, ironic humor. And also he has in common with me, he likes big voluptuous women, so I like that aspect of it also. He draws them beautifully, so exquisitely he draws those women. <laughs> He's completely obsessed with pornography. He's a total loser. <laughs> His wife dumped him because oh, he spent too much time looking at pornography on the internet. <laughs> no, but it's nice to be in a country where comics are taken seriously as an adult art form, you know? When we were working in America years ago, comics weren't looked at all seriously. Maybe more so now, but, you know, the tradition is very... Valid and considered an important for art form. What, in France, you mean? Yeah. 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 Hello, Mr. Crump. Uh, I hear you uh, are not very happy with the animated film version of one of your characters, and I want to ask you are there any animated cartoons, maybe from the past, from the 30s or 40s, you like to watch? Sure. I like to watch old Max Fleischer cart yes. animated cartoons too. from the 1930s. And that's <laughs> my favorite animated cartoon. Right. Some of the best of the Disney stuff from the 30s and 40s. I like that. The works works. Really yeah, stuff like that, yeah. Yes. But modern animation doesn't interest me. And I, I would not... I've, Refuse a lot of proposals to mm. animate my stuff in recent years. It's it's just you know it's too compromising to work with all these other people and it's you know the the financial realities of it is too much. It's very expensive to do and everything. Yes. You know yeah I didn't like the Fritz the Cat thing that they did. Didn't think that really worked very well. Is that why you killed Fritz? That's why I had to kill him off in 1972. <laughs> <laughs> That Ralph Bakshi, who did the Fritz the Cat cartoon, is very, very angry at me because I've publicly said so many times that I don't like the the, the animated cartoon that he did. So he's deeply hurt. Yeah, he's deeply hurt. Oh, <laughs> poor guy. Thank you. Robert, you said you had a German music. I'd be interested to hear you talk about the idea of you know, German art and whether it's important to work. I don't oh, sorry, I'll say that again. Yeah. Uh, you, you said that you hated uh, German music. <laughs> I'd be interested to hear you talk about German art and your opinion of it and whether that's in well, still work. You and didn't also, say he hated German music. Yeah, he hated yeah. German rock music. Yeah. 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 And Harry took me to hear... But he rock music anyway. Harry took me to a club he went to to impress me with some band that he thought was good, some German kind of, I don't know, country western rockabilly band. And I just thought it wasn't very good. And, you know, didn't, but that's just my taste. I, you know, as far as German culture goes, I mean, there's incredible stuff that's been produced. In, but what do you mean by German art? You mean contemporary German art? Or? Or Actually, I mean, I was thinking in particular because I'm working on a comic about George Gross, and I know I, I know that you guys both enjoy his work. I'm yeah. just sort of sure. interested in you. I love that stuff. <laughs> the, the stuff from the 20s and 30s. It's yeah. incredible stuff. Otto Dix and Christian Schad and all those guys. That's great art. Is that art very still very widely appreciated in Germany that, that those guys did? Because it's still, it's very negative, it's dark and negative. In America, it's very hard to find books of those guys' work. The Green Show at the Met, what, about six years ago, and uh, all the German expressions that was a great success. Hey, Aileen told me, what was that? Went to Mannheim to yeah, see that show? I took a 14 hour train ride from France to Mannheim to see the new Sachekite show, which was, I was in that museum in Mannheim, it was this incredible building, there was nobody there, it was amazing. And, it was an incredible and she said she had the whole museum to yeah, herself. Exactly. <laughs> she see this incredible art. A lot of those artists are even they rarely ever get to see their work even published in books. That the names are so obscure on them. Yeah, it's great work. That's some of my favorite stuff actually. But so dark and negative. <laughs> People don't like that. They want to see pretty stuff. Um, also, the Germans were very advanced graphically in the 20s and 30s. Um, sorry, my 
English is very, very bad, it's terrible. Perhaps you have uh, said already um, the answer of my question, but perhaps not, and so I'll ask you that. Did you understand um, very much of what has been said so far? <laughs> um, the point is that, um, what do you make now? Also not in the moment, but... Uh, <laughs> I wanna, um, um, the, the reason why I ask is, uh, I really like your comics. I, I well, thank the, you, sir. With the, with the new uh, things of that, not the Genesis, other, your, your, your classical uh, comic, more from the, more from the things from the 90s, and uh, yeah. in this way, uh, mm -hmm. can you work again? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm finished. I've quit. It's over. I'm too old. It's a young man's game. Oh. No, I don't know. I can't answer that question. I never know what I'm going to do from one minute to the next. I don't, I don't like to talk about plans and shit. That's always tedious. And if, you too, talk too much, you see. if you talk too much about what you're going to do, you don't do it. Yeah. But I appreciate your, uh, your support. Um, I mean, you did this, this great book, uh, Need More Love, that somehow went under because the publisher went bankrupt or something. Yeah, uh, that's right. Which I think is terrible. Uh, do you have any plans to follow up, do something that won't go bankrupt? Everything I do, I'm the kiss of death. Any publisher that publishes me always, like, either goes out of business or goes bankrupt. If you ask Chris Kitchen, he published my book, Power Pack, and I think you told me you used it as insulation in your barn. And then, it's true. Yeah. And then, and then uh, it's true. And I'm not exaggerating. And Need More Love, um, it was a, so I thought this woman was my friend who was a publisher, so I didn't take any money in advance because she, I said, well, when you sell books, you can pay me. And she you said, didn't okay. do it through your agent. I didn't use my agent because I, this was my dear friend. I couldn't, like, doubt her honesty. So Robert and I were giving a talk at the New York Public Library talking about my new book coming out. On Valentine's Day. On Valentine's Day, because it's called Need More Love. It was a big event, and you know, maybe a thousand people were there. I was so impressed that I was talking, at, I was impressed that I was talking at the New York Library. I was really full of myself and thought, I've really made it now. And then I, uh, that night, that, that day, they went bankrupt. <laughs> I, I never got a cent, not only that, but like they put us up in a hotel in New York, I ended up having to pay the bill. <laughs> not only that, they had published a book of Robert's that I convinced him to publish because they were my friends. And they all of the go they, didn't, they didn't go through our agent, Laura, and all of the images that they had used were not properly copyrighted, so they were all completely in jeopardy. So I had to hire a lawyer to get a revision a reversion of copyrights back to us from this poorly protected work, and I had to pay $35,000. So not only did I not make money, I ended up like almost $50,000 in the hole, but this book, Need More Love, so weird. So that company was taken over by sort of another company that just got the remainder in stock this from them. There's a company in England called Octopus. Octopus. They just buy distressed oh. businesses and then remainder or shred the books or something. So I guess I shredded most of my books, but I managed to get... They offered you how many copies? I got, I guess I got 500 or something. Yeah. And they're, they're, a lot of them were bought by the Strand Bookstore in New York, and then somehow they got onto Amazon, and my book miraculously sells all over the world. Like, we went to Brazil, and like tons of people had my book. Awesome. Every, no matter where I go, I find my book. Over here in India, yeah. somebody brought this copy of your book that was so strange. A yeah. version of it I'd never seen before. That they found in India. So, it's, and then a, an American publisher offered to redo this book in a better version. I said, no, I'm going to leave it alone because it has this weird life of its own. And it travels in a weird way. I don't know where the money goes when someone buys a book. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't get it. But it has like a life of its own. And it, it's sort of fabulous. So I'm just leaving it as it is. Don't, don't, don't you want to do another project where you will also get some money? I don't know. <laughs> She's doing the artwork like for, you know, exhibiting on the walls, doing paintings and I don't know. stuff I, like that. I have part of another book started, but I don't know if I'll do it before I die. Maybe always had an erotic attitude about drawing <laughs> comics. 
You know, and after going through a period of drawing a lot of comics, she'd say, I'm never doing this again. So you do this many times. I never earned any money, and basically I was totally unappreciated Aww. until now that I don't care you anymore. Know, you always have your small following. <laughs> your little following. This is Jewish women that like your stuff. Well, you start drawing a comic, do you write a script? No. No. Never no, write scripts. No. I just start, both of us just start on the page, you know. But when we draw our comics together now, sometimes we kind of work it out to some degree beforehand so that it makes some kind of coherent sense. I know sense. you want to say something, you kind of have a seed of an important idea, but if you plot the whole story out, it's kind of finished and you lose interest in drawing it. Whereas if you don't know what's going to happen, it's kind of a challenge to how you're going to end it. You like that? Yeah. Sir, we talk about comics, but not about music. Yeah. You are a fifty musician. What <coughs> is with a uh, uh, new to the with your old friend Bob Brosman? Oh. He permanently mm -hmm. traveled Germany. Yeah. You know, you know, Brosman just recently killed himself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Age fifty-nine. Yep. Yeah. He pulled his car to the garage and turned on the gas. Oh. But this guy said that I'm a gifted musician, but I beg to differ. I'm not a gifted musician. I have a really good ear. Yeah, good ear, but yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't have that. Yeah. I'm, I'm a gifted artist, I'll you know, admit to that, but I'm <coughs> a second-rate musician. But I like old music, you know. I'm crazy about the music. Oh, both. No, it has, it has a certain charm, but... Boy. You should listen to their old stuff, listen to the real stuff. Don't listen to us, don't listen to my crappy band. Listen to yeah, the old... You also collected 78. Yeah. You still do collect 78. But you say old crap? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice that you appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> um, I had a question. Um, what was your main problem when you're drawing comics? <laughs> Was it, okay, I have a script, I have to draw what's in the script, or is it... Oh, oh, there you go. oh emergency security. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because sometimes when I'm drawing a graphic or maybe a little comic, I'm drawing it, and in the moment of the drawing, I see, oh, I don't even like this character anymore, so I can it throw it away. Or I don't like to draw this style anymore. Do you have the same problems in these, or have the same problems? Yeah, problems? sure, of course, same problems, just like you. No. <laughs> <laughs> no different, and it never gets easier. Do you have any <laughs> tips for it? So <laughs> I don't have to. Uh, I don't like to. Can I be a character? I don't like. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. But you just have to to keep working. That's all. You just keep doing it, keep doing it, and and uh, hopefully. People will appreciate it, that's all. And you'll get better at it. Yeah, you might, get, you might improve too, that's always a possibility. <laughs> but if it actually gets too easier, that's when you're really in trouble. If it gets too facile and easy to do, that means that you've settled into a formula, you've gotten into a rut, and then that's to be avoided at all costs, even if it means you have to kill yourself. <laughs> yeah. Or stop, quit, do something else. But you don't want to get in a rut. Then that's a big, big danger of drawing comics, because especially if you settle into a set of characters that work for you somehow, I mean, people did the same characters for 50, 60 years, you know, it's like, oh, it gets kind of you know, boring after a while. Thank you, I have a question. I think I read a comic by you before I even knew your name. And when I think back to it, it's very vivid, the art. Um, and it's called Hair Care Comics and Stories. It's about how to take care of your hair and kill pubic lice with vinegar and things like that. Did you write that? Does that sound familiar? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was one of those crumb imitators. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, there was a lot of guys that drew like me back in the old days. It was easy to imitate. <laughs> it's accessible. 
on the ground that some of your work has been highly provocative in political way. What is your attitude towards uh, political correctness? Do you think it's uh, the privilege of the artist to be politically incorrect? Yes, I do. It's a privilege of the artist to be as politically incorrect and offensive as he wants to be. It's the job of the artist to be. <laughs> <laughs> But whether or not anybody's going to publish it or anybody's going to read it, that's another matter. You know, they, you know, you can't force it down their throat. So you think, oh boy, I'm going to be offensive, you know, and, and then and the expect people to love it. Maybe one or two guys will like it and the rest of the people will hate it, you don't know. I mean, in my work, when I decided to do, draw whatever crazy shit was in my subconscious mind, I immediately alienated the entire, almost the entire female population. Forget about them, they're not going to like it. I, I didn't realize that until after the fact, you know. When it came out, I could all of a sudden, oh, the women were hurt, they were offended, and I couldn't blame them. I couldn't say, yeah, they should, should love it. So, you know, yeah, you take your chances, but I was sure, should, the government shouldn't try and stop you. But, you know, in, a, in, in that way, I'm kind of a right-wing guy when it comes to art and comics. I believe that actually should be sort of a free market in that way, you know. You can't, uh, you can't s s apply the s socialist economic ideal to artistic expression. That doesn't work so good. So, like, government <laughs> subsidizing of art. Forget about government subsidizing comics. It'd be awful. Barbara and I worked for a lot of left-wing papers in the That's 70s right, yeah. and 80s, and right. there, there was a lack of humor. It was a problem. I mean, right. I did a, I did some comic strips, and they accused me of being anti-Semitic and, and, and sexist. sexist, racist, and anti-Semitic. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. You know, so there was a lack of humor in the political movement, which didn't tolerate any kind of individualist yeah. expression. So political. That, that's, Correctness can Attention. be a kind of wet blanket. Well, to art, you know, to yeah. art. Robert, I think maybe a lot of people miss the point when you're being really uh, satirical that yeah. you're making fun of yourself as well. Right. Your own people, obsessions. Some people mistake it for, they take it at face value. You know, they mistake it, they don't see the satire a lot of times. And so they're offended because they don't see the irony in it or something, well, you can't expect them to. If, you, if they don't get it, they don't get it. It's not, it's not their fault. It's the, the worst case when the Robert did a story called When the Jews and the Niggers Take Over America. No. It's a very controversial story. <laughs> and he, and he, that story was picked up by this neo-Nazi group in America and they used it on their website. The, the, they loved it. They loved it. They loved it. Well, he's one of us. They, they, they printed it in their newsletter. Yeah. They thought it was That's great. So Crumb is, he, he's lines. one of us. Crumb is one of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dangerous line you're treading, you know? And Americans really don't traditionally understand well, satire that well. Think well. I think people all over the world mostly aren't that sophisticated. They take things literally, yeah. Most people do. I remember I was invited to a, a art class to give, give a talk about my comics, and I showed them this comic I'd done where I kind of had this Chinese stereotype talking in like, you know, stereotypical Chinese language, kind of making fun of the stereotype. And this, this young Asian Chinese woman in the class, she was deeply offended and thought I was a racist against Chinese and started giving me a hard time. And I don't so you, you, you get the satire or you don't, you know. It's... One last question. Really? <laughs> I seem to remember that you also did work for the Village Voice, is that correct? Village Voice? No. East Village Other, you mean? East Village Other, ah. not the Village Voice. Oh, I did work for the Village Voice, you're right. <laughs> how, did, how did that come about? Mid-70s. Yeah, they, they asked me if I wanted to do a weekly strip for the Village Voice. I thought, wow, great, I'll have a, fine, I'll have a secure income, I'll have a regular predictable income, you know, if you do We, they, they offered to pay me, I think, uh, $200 per strip or something like that. So, great. It was in the 70s. I was broke. I had no money. So, I did it. But after a year, I just got sick of doing this relentless thing you know, for every week. And I got tired of it, so I quit. But, yeah, then I collected the strips into a book. But I realized I, I couldn't do a regular strip like that. I just don't have it in me. I got to hate the character. I was doing Mr. Natural, and I just got to hate it. So I had to stop.
That's, I'm amazed that Bill Griffith, who does the Zippy the Pinhead comic strip in daily newspapers, and it's he's been doing it for for 30 years, and it's still funny. It's amazing. I don't know how he does it, but now he can be funny every day like that. Jeez, I couldn't do it. In that way, I'm not a, really a true cartoonist because to be a most of the time to be a working cartoonist, you have to just cre really turn it out on a regular basis. Okay, then we're all done here. Right? Thank you.